Welcome, everyone. My name is David Sandalo. I'm the inaugural fellow here at the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy, and we're thrilled today to have two distinguished experts to talk about China's global energy finance. Uh, I am just back from Beijing last week, uh, where the topics that we are about to discuss today are very much on the minds and the lips of, of lots of people. Um, I'm also I'm pleased to announce that the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy now has a WeChat account. Uh, so please go follow us, subscribe to us on WeChat. We're going to try to post the barcode, and we're going to send around the barcode so all of, us, all of you can join. We are going to regularly translate our uh, research reports uh, into Chinese and distribute them on WeChat. Um, so uh, uh, please subscribe to us there. Um, uh, this event is being uh, webcast live, just like all of our events. Um, and uh, if you have questions and are watching in our web audience, you can ask questions on Twitter at the hashtag CGEC events, at Center on Global Energy Policy events, CGEC events. And please follow us on twi Twitter on at Columbia U Energy. Um, uh, today, to, to, talk about our, uh, to talk about energy finance and China's energy finance, we have um, two of the world's leading experts, and we're thrilled that they're here. Uh, they've just done some uh, uh, important research, which they're going to tell us about. Then we'll have a conversation, um, and then we'll open up to all of you, because I know we've got some uh, expertise uh, sitting right here in the room as well. Um, our first speaker is Bo Kong. He's the ConocoPhillips Petroleum Professor of Chinese and Asian Studies at uh, the University of Oklahoma's College of International Studies. He's also a senior fellow at the John Hopkins School of International Studies, called usually known as SICE and at CSIS, the Center for Strategic International Studies um, in Washington, D.C. Um, he's the author of a number of books, um, including uh, China's International Petroleum Policy in 2010 and editor of Energy Security Cooperation in Northeast Asia last year. He's got a B.A. in International Trade from Nankai University, uh, earned his master's from SAIS and his Ph.D. in Chinese Studies uh, from the American Foreign Policy Institute. My second uh, speaker is uh, Kevin Gallagher, um, who's a professor of global development policy at Boston University's Party School of Global Studies, where he co-directs the Global Economic Governance Initiative and the Global Development Policy Program. His new book is The China Triangle, Latin America's China Boom and the uh, Sale of... Uh, fate. The, the fate, thank you. Can't read the handwriting. The fate <laughs> of the Washington Consensus. Uh, Gallagher has edited or co-edited a number of books, including Rethinking Foreign Investment uh, uh, for Sustainable Development, Lessons from Latin America, and Putting Development First. Um, he's the co-chair of the Task Force on Regulating Capital Flows. He um, writes a regular column for Financial Times and The Guardian. We're delighted to have both of them. We'll start with a uh, presentation by Professor Kahn. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, David, for your kind introduction. It gives me a, a distinct honor and privilege to be here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. I would also like to thank uh, Julie Moreno for her kind assistance with uh, the logistics involved to put together this event. I also would like to thank my colleague Kevin Gallagher for giving, giving me this opportunity to present our studies together. And uh, today, uh, I would like to present some of the findings of our work. And, but in, in, uh, in light of time constraint, I'm not able to discuss every aspect of the study. But, but uh, I believe the study, our studies have been posted on the website uh, of, for the Center on Global Energy Policy. And instead, instead I'm only going to provide a highlight of our study. Um, but Feel free to ask broad questions, and I'll be happy to entertain them during the Q&A session. Uh, let me begin with the fundamental research questions that motivate our work. Our, our fundamental goal in this exercise is to understand how China has globalized its energy finance over the past decade or so. And more importantly, we're interested to understand how China has globalized its energy finance. And our, our central findings are um, China has uh, emerged to become the largest provider 
of development finance for energy in a very short span of time, primarily through its twin policy banks, the, the China Development Bank and China Export and Import Bank. And now, um, the, the fundamental reason uh, why China has uh, globalized its energy finance through the, the two policy banks uh, is, to, is twofold. First, um, the state has a lot of vertical control and horizontal uh, coordinating ability to integrate energy and finance. And secondly, the state plays a very large role in capital uh, mobilization. And now, let me turn to the, uh, the way we conceptualize this, uh, this question. Uh, before we get started, the question we ask ourselves is how we analyze uh, the globalization of Chinese energy finance. The way we think about this is along two lines. We can uh, see, we basically see two manifestations of this globalization of Chinese energy finance. On the one hand, we see uh, growing Chinese, growing investment by Chinese energy companies across the world and in the form of greenfield investment and in the, in the, in the form of mergers and acquisitions. And the, another manifestation is the provision of development finance uh, to governments around the world for energy. And note, uh, our numbers do not, do not include the energy-backed loans or, or projects uh, undertaken by Chinese companies when uh, the lending uh, was provided to foreign governments. If we do include those numbers, and the, the, the numbers actually are a lot bigger. Now, before I get to the analysis, before I get to how China actually does this, let me just uh, show you a couple of key statistics so that you get a sense of the magnitude of um, China's role in global energy finance here. If you, um, we um, compiled some data on the basis of um, uh, the, um, the data we acquired from these two databases, the FD uh, Intelligence and Deal Logic, and we cross-verified all the data, basically. And, and what you see is quite uh, uh, striking in that uh, Chinese companies have collectively uh, provided over uh, a quarter a trillion dollars to the global energy markets in the form of greenfield investment and uh, mergers acquisitions. And interestingly, um, there is a little bit uh, uh, difference in ter variation in terms of uh, the global distribution of these two types of uh, investment. In terms of greenfield investment, the, the majority has gone into uh, developing countries, whereas mergers and acquisitions, contrary to the conventional wisdom, actually has primarily gone to industrialized economies. And I will not spend too much time on the, uh, the uh, details here. Instead, I want to just extrapolate the message and, and uh, use the message to perform an analysis. That is, uh, if you look at the corporate side, certainly you get the sense that Chinese energy companies have become a major contributor to global energy finance. Then, there's the, um, then the question is, who is financing all this investment done by Chinese energy companies? And if you look at the numbers, uh, my colleague uh, Kevin and, and uh, his team at Boston University have done some uh, empirical work to look at who is financing China's uh, overseas foreign direct investment. And the top players behind China's growing overseas foreign direct investment are the China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank. And the majority of the investment uh, over the past decade, between 2002 and 2012, went to uh, mining and oil. And in, you know, on that basis, we basically conclude that the CDB and China Exim Bank are the largest uh, financiers of the Chinese energy investment around the world. And in addition to the corporate side here, I want to just skim through this data because my colleague will spend a little, a little bit more time on this. The other side is the provision of uh, direct finance to governments around the world. I just want to just uh, give you the bottom line. That is, uh, the two development banks have together provided as much as the, uh, the combined total of multilateral development banks supported uh, based in the West. 
and, and in terms of the, the distribution, it's also uh, global as well. And uh, my colleague Kevin will uh, say a few uh, more words on this, so I'm gonna uh, continue with my analysis. So how, why? I mean, the, the two questions are how, why the, the two policy banks have become the, the, the primer uh, instruments uh, the, the Chinese government has used to finance uh, global energy projects. And secondly, and how does it do it? And in terms of why, I think the, the answer is quite clear that uh, the alternative forms of finance are not sufficient. You have uh, basically forms, five forms of finance, uh, or two, uh, to put it more uh, simply, direct finance, indirect finance. And uh, within direct finance, you're talking about uh, uh, equity markets and debt markets. And then indirect finance, you're primarily looking at uh, uh, the role of banks. But in China, there is also this uh, form of fiscal finance and policy finance. And the reason why the policy, policy finance has played such a role is that all other forms of finance are basically prevented from having a meaningful role. If you look at the role of capital markets, certainly it's true that over time, the capital markets are now more accessible and, and Chinese energy companies have been relying more and more on capital markets to raise uh, funding for projects at home and abroad, but nevertheless, um, the capital markets are still constrained on multiple fronts that I will not have time to get into now. And the, the same is true for commercial banks, particularly state-owned commercial banks, and in fact, the state-owned commercial banks are confronted with a number of regulatory constraints that prevent them from provide acquisition lending to Chinese companies when they go abroad. And fiscal finance, of course, simply the size of fiscal finance is not big enough to, to play a meaningful role here. And the other reason that the uh, policy finance or the two policy banks have played such a prominent role is that uh, China, different from many countries in the world, uh, particularly the United States, actually engages in financial targeting through these two policy banks. What, I'm, what I mean here is that when the policy banks provide lending to, uh, in the area of energy, um, the policy banks have a number of objectives in mind. One objective is to assist the country with attempt to, to secure energy all around the world. The other uh, um, a uh, fundamental uh, policy driver is this concern about um, the value of uh, uh, the preservation and enhancement of the country's foreign exchange reserves, uh, particularly at a time when the U.S. engaged in quantitative easing. And the, the third element uh, is industrial policy. China uh, wanted to, uh, to use these twin policy banks to support the going abroad of Chinese energy companies to help them uh, expand market share and, and import, uh, buy and acquire technologies they can bring back home to uh, un un unlock reserves at home. And then, how does China do this? Well, I argue, we argue that China does this uh, primarily through the vertical control and the horizontal control the state has over the financial institutions. Here, I won't be able to uh, go into details of what each player is here. Instead, I would just point out that uh, there are four energy germane bureaucracies and four uh, finance germane bureaucracies that have direct regulatory power over energy and finance issues. And the, the Chinese government, Chinese state, particularly the Central Organization Party of the CCP, appoints the top executives of state financial institutions and, and state energy uh, companies as if they are government bureaucrats. And in other words, these top executives of the policy, the two policy banks and the energy SOEs all enjoy bureaucratic ranks. And so you can, all, they, they almost operate in many respects like bureaucratic officials. Of course they have other hats as well, but that ownership gives the state the ability to, to, to appoint top personnel and to have uh, control over them with respect to regulatory affairs and with respect to um, the strategic direction of these companies. And so that's one way the state integrates energy and finance. The other way, of course, is to uh, foster uh, horizontal coordination between these eight bureaucracies when carrying out this uh, 
going out strategy, when carrying out this one road, one belt strategy. So you're gonna see a lot of horizontal coordination in addition to the vertical control. These are the fundamental mechanisms the state uses to integrate energy and finance. In addition, the state also plays a very indispensable role in mobilizing capital for the state, the, for the two policy banks. And here let me do a, a very quick mini case study of the CDB, the China Development Bank, which was built, which was created in 1994 as a policy bank primarily focused on domestic development priorities. But over time, however, it has become the largest player in development finance. Now, um, a it provides more foreign lending than any banks in China, but it only accounts for 5% of the banking assets in China. And you may wonder how this has happened. And it really to understand how this has happened, you really have to go back and understand the fundamental drivers behind the global expansion of these, these, the, the, the policy bank. And one way to look at it is to um, try to understand how the CDB has obtained funding. On paper, the CDB primarily obtains its funding from uh, bonds and deposits. And note, the CDB is very, very different from commercial banks in that the CDB is not allowed to engage in attracting households' deposits. Therefore, the deposits that have actually primarily uh, the corporate deposits and deposits from, from governments, thanks to the, the, uh, the stimulus uh, programs China launched over the past couple of years. But primarily China is a, uh, pr primarily the CDB is a bond-based bank. You can tell the CDB actually, uh, the bond, the CDB issues account for about 20% of the bonds China issues as a whole. And by the way, China's debt market, you know, bond market is the third largest in the world. It has been growing by lips and bonds. And in fact, if you look at the, the growth, you will, be, you will be really impressed with the pace of growth, 17-fold over the past decade also. And so this gives you a sense of where CDB obtains its money. But this is a bit misleading though, I argue, because it doesn't tell you why the CDB is able to uh, obtain funding from bonds. And it doesn't tell you much about the role of the state in capital mobilization behind the expansion of the global expansion of CDB. And here we trace the, the role of the state by looking at basically why the state uh, state-owned commercial banks have to obtain, have to buy bonds from the CDB, and in fact, they buy 80% of the bonds uh, the CDB sells. The reason is that the state-owned commercial banks and the CDB belong, uh, on, uh, on, you know, are regulated, uh, are housed under the same institution, that is the Ministry of Finance. That is, the Ministry of Finance is the owner of both the CDB and China, China, and, China commercial, and, and, and the state-owned commercial banks. And so, you know, in addition, this China Banking Regulatory Commission also gives zero risk weighting to the CDB when it issues bonds. In other words, you don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about risks because it's, it's almost a sovereign bond. And so it makes commercial sense for the state commercial banks actually to buy uh, the bonds from CDB as well. And in addition to the, uh, um, to, to the role of commercial banks in providing all the, all the funding to CDB uh, on the basis of the deposits they attract from households in China, and the, um, the central government, the state, uses its coffers actually to pump money directly to the CDB and it pumps money directly through the central bank, the PBOC, and the foreign exchange administrative agency, SAFE, as well. And recently, in 2015, PBOC pumped $48 billion into the CDB to become the second largest owner of the CDB. And Ministry of Finance did that as well. Uh, in 2007, the Ministry of Finance pumped $20 billion into the CDB. And back even to the late 1990s, it pumped even more uh, into the CDB. And so through these two mechanisms, the state really has played this, has really, you know, uh, has really played this role of indispensable sort of a mobilized, capital sort of a mobilizer. Uh, or, you know, it played this indispensable role in mobilizing capital for, for the, uh, the, the, uh, the CDB. And just to recap, 
um, the story of China's um, rise in global energy finance is, is really a story of the Chinese state um, engaging financial uh, statecraft through the twin policy banks. And the reason why the state is able to do it is that the state has both vertical control and horizontal coordination, and the state plays a prominent role in, in mobilizing capital for the twin policy banks. What does this mean? What are the policy implications of this? There are a lot of policy implications. As China rolls out this one road, one belt strategy under this current uh, leadership, uh, we are likely to see more uh, prominent participation of these banks, particularly the two policy banks. And note that in 2015, the Chinese government announced that the CDB will no longer uh, pursue and continue its commercial reform. Instead, it will be a policy bank period. That means that the identity of the CDB actually is less ambiguous than before between 2007 and, 2007 and 2050. The CDB actually was pushed to pursue commercial reform. And this means that uh, it's likely that the, these banks are going to play a, a, a very prominent role in, in supporting these projects, but against this uh, uh, set of uncertainties as the Chinese economy is slowing down, as, this, uh, as the government engages in more um, bank-based uh, or, or you know, lending-based uh, growth as to, you know, certainly the, this model raises questions as to how long China can, can do this. And the other set of um, implications that have a lot to do with what this finance means for the global effort to address climate change, and, uh, and my colleague will say uh, um, a lot more on this. So why don't I just stop here, and th I thank you for your attention, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was thank you, Bo. Um, thank you, David. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Uh, Bo and I did these two studies: one, fueling growth and financing risk, the benefits and risks of Chinese development finance in the energy sector. That's the one I'll talk about. We also did one called the globalization of Chinese energy companies, and we've been giving talks all over Washington and in China and elsewhere. But now, given this new center, you really can't uh, you can't go on a tour with a new study uh, without stopping at the new center here at uh, at Columbia. So congratulations on it. It's just uh, a vibrant community and we're really happy to be part of it. I want to thank Julie for, for helping to coordinate it and Bo Kong for all the work that we've been doing together. Um, <clears throat> this paper was originally just intended to be an input into the larger study that Bo presented. He showed one table on Chinese policy bank or the develop China's two development banks and their l lending to foreign governments in the form of energy. <clears throat> but the study has taken a bit of a life of its own and uh, has, some, has some broad implications in, in and of itself. <clears throat> And essentially what we're really trying to do in, the, in, this, in this particular study is uh, look at, estimate what are the levels and the composition of Chinese policy bank lending to foreign governments in the energy sector worldwide. Unlike the World Bank or the Inter-American Development Bank, you can't just go to the CDB webpage and download project level data around the world. Um, there isn't a consistent place to find the data and so we uh, we went out and tried to build, build a, our own data set, uh, basically from the ground up, looking at host country finance ministry web pages and annual reports and central bank reports and IMF reports to build it from the ground up. And I'm, I'm happy to say we, uh, we came pretty close. We've come to real, uh, we're now in conversation with both of the banks and we're off by about uh, 40 to $70 billion, which uh, is, is uh, not quite an order of magnitude, but in the right direction. Um, four, three points. Uh, China's emerged as a leader in development finance in general. I'll show you that the China development, these two China development banks, the China Export Import Bank and the uh, China Development Bank are now the largest sources of development finance on the planet and in energy in particular. Um, however, uh, we make the case in this paper that the China development lending, especially in energy space, is exposed to real economic, social, and environmental risk. 
These banks, because of the uh, policy-making dynamics that Bo just pointed out, are really poised to be major players in a transition to a clean energy future, but uh, it's clearly not uh, inevitable that that will be the case. So uh, the first slide here shows the fact that the Export-Import Bank of China and the China Development Bank are the two largest development financial institutions in the world. Their assets combined are over $2 trillion, and if you add those, uh, that's, uh, oh, what did I do? Wrong one. Where's the, the uh, pointer? Is this? Yep. Yeah. So um, the top two are the Export-Import Bank of China and the China Development Bank. Uh, their assets, uh, their, their total global assets are around $2 trillion. If you add all the multilateral development banks, they're at about $700 billion. Um, that said, the overseas exposure, the assets that they have overseas are around $700 billion, um, these two China banks. So the two China banks overseas financing to uh, countries is exactly, uh, almost exactly the same size of all the MDBs combined. But if you add the domestic component of the balance sheet of the CDB and the Export-Import Bank, uh, they, uh, they, they dwarf the MDBs almost two to one. On top of the Export-Import Bank of China and the China, uh, and the China Development Bank and their finance to developing country, or country governments around the world, um, there's a number of China-backed development financial funds and institutions that have been set up by uh, other multilateral funds and bilateral funds around the world. Here's a map of them. Oh, I keep doing the wrong thing here. Uh, here we go. The ones that get the most press are the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the New Development Bank. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank will have about $100 billion in capital and has $50 billion in subscribed capital right now. The New Development Bank will, is also aims for $100 billion in subscribed capital and has $50 billion right now. Um, there, is, there is the Silk Road Fund, which actually sits... Uh, uh, the Silk Road Fund and the Green Silk Road Fund, to try to make it somewhat green, and the China ASEAN Fund uh, is the region of the world um, where the largest amount of, uh, of these funds occurs. And the second largest is Latin America. There's actually four different funds that add up to almost $40 billion uh, for a number of major infrastructure and energy projects. Um, some in Africa, about $22 billion worth of finance, and six in, uh, six in Eurasia. And two other multilateral funds. One is the South-South Climate Fund, which is uh, China's alternative to the Green Climate Fund, and something similar called the South-South Cooperation Fund, which is a new fund set up to uh, advance the sustainable development goals. The core of a lot of these funds and much of the uh, CDB and Export-Import Bank uh, finance is for something that some people call China's Marshall Plan, which the Chinese themselves called the Belt Road Initiative. But you, can, you hear it uh, referred to a number of things, the Silk Road Fund, the One Belt, One Road Initiative, uh, et cetera. And this is a massive infrastructure revitalization of the old Silk Road routes, both in terms of maritime and in, in road. Um, sorry. So this is, uh, uh, this is our total estimate here, which is off by $40 billion, we just learned. So we had estimated for this study that China's two policy banks provide upwards of $117 billion to foreign governments in the energy sector, which was basically just on par uh, with, the, uh, with, uh, with all the MDBs combined. This is how... Uh, this is how it compares with the other major MDBs. Um, luckily, the Financial Times did a front page story on, our, on this paper when it came out, and then they translated it into Chinese. And when it got into Chinese, it became big, big news in China, and one of our Chinese co-authors was contacted by the China Development Bank and sat down with them, and they said, where'd you get this data? Uh, we don't publish that. And they said, yeah, we worked with these folks in Boston University, and uh, we came up with an estimate. And they said, you did a pretty good job. You're up by $40 billion, but given the fact that the the size of the loan is five to seven often. Uh, we weren't off by that many projects. So it turns out we're, we're bad at Russia. We missed six projects in Russia, um, and uh, uh, mostly oil and gas, um, and, uh, and two renewable energy projects in, in Bulgaria. Um, and so these numbers will, are in the process of being uh, uh, adjusted. We're hoping that we can have a similar kind of dialogue with the Export-Import Bank of, uh, of China to get, to get on target here. Um, the distribution of uh, 
China Development Bank and China Export Import Bank finance for energy to developing to countries around the world is truly global, as you can see here. Uh, it's everywhere. Uh, the Middle East and, and North Africa is relatively small, but in almost every area, it's on par or larger, uh, larger than the World Bank. Um, the uh, and the Silk Road areas are the largest. What is the energy composition? It's all about power. Uh, this is a pie graph of the $117 billion, and about 80% of it goes to uh, power generation, 7% to extraction and refining, and 13% to transmission and distribution. And in terms of which sectors the power plant's in, it's really all about uh, coal and hydroelectric power plants. The first, uh, the first column here are the China banks um, and the distribution of the kinds of power projects and so forth relative to their uh, MDB counterparts. And 93% of all Chinese overseas energy finance is in coal or big hydro. Um, in terms of coal, the climate, uh, our study only looks at actual projects that are actually on the ground where you can fly to the place and go and look at a power plant. The Climate Policy Institute estimates that there's another 32 to $72 billion worth of uh, finance for coal plants. Um, uh, can, so the, that, this, is, this is sort of the data, this is the picture that, um, that uh, China is the largest energy, public energy financier in the world. It's uh, providing a lot of finance for energy and infrastructure around the world. Um, and it's largely in coal and large hydro. Uh, we're concerned that, that while this is an incredible complement to the global energy mix, that uh, it's, it's in, it, it faces a lot of risk. One key risk is macroeconomic risk. If you, if you pair the Chinese finance for energy in the world, on the one hand, it's good because it doesn't compete with the World Bank and the multilateral developments. It complements. It goes into a different set of countries and a different set of sectors. So it's not competition. It's broadening the availability of energy around the world. This just compares the top 20 country, uh, top 20 recipients of the Chinese energy finance, which is about 80% of it. And the star next to it shows that there aren't any multi most of the countries don't get any, any finance for energy from the MDBs, but their OECD risk ratings are a lot higher. Um, and some of their political risk ratings are even, are even higher. Um, and many of these countries are natural resource exporting economies that over the past two years have seen massive uh, decreases in exports due to a decrease in demand from China uh, for commodities. And corresponding with the decrease in exports uh, has been a, a real devaluation of their currencies. And so a lot of these countries, as the, if you look at the World Economic Outlook that the IMF put out two weeks ago, a lot of these countries are really on the brink of currency risk and corporate debt risk. And uh, China, um, uh, China is, is exposed to a lot of countries that if you go to the WEO, you'll see that they're all on the brink of, uh, of some, of some a very concerning corporate and sometimes sovereign desk, uh, debt considerations, such as in the case of Venezuela. Another one is the environmental risk associated with uh, China's overseas loan portfolio. 66% of all of the over overseas finance uh, in power plants is in coal. 58% of those coals are, are in subcritical. This is a distribution of, uh, this pie chart here is a distribution of them. 7.7 uh, billion is just checksum, 8.8 .8 billion is CDB, but you can see the majority of them, 11.7 billion, are uh, co-financed between the CDB and the Export-Import Bank. We, uh, we uh, calculated the annual emissions of all of these plants, and they're about 594 MMT. Uh, to, put that, to put that into perspective, that's about 11% of U.S. emissions for 2014 and 6% of the Chinese. But if you combine these together, just the Chinese Development Bank's overseas finance of coal plants would put them at the eighth largest emitter in the world. Um, if you look at a 30-year time horizon, that's around the time where all these plants uh, would be in, in, uh, in their lifetime, we calculate that their emissions will be something like 17,828 MMT. Now, if you calculate that using conservative estimates of the social cost of carbon and the social cost of the air pollution related to that, uh, we estimate that the annual social costs 
of these plants is about $29.7 billion per year. Uh, depending upon what kind of discount rate you want to use moving forward, that could be about 117 to $892 billion in social costs uh, over the 30-year period, $117 billion with a discount rate of zero, uh, $892 billion with a discount rate of seven. <clears throat> Another series of risks is uh, social, uh, social and ecological risk. Uh, from other work that our institute has done, uh, we're looking a lot at the role of these banks in financing projects uh, in Latin America. And all of these uh, colors here, everything in light blue, are Chinese finance, dams, mines, and uh, energy concessions. And the green are some of the most biodiverse areas in the world. The greener it is, the more biodiverse it is. And the yellow here are some of the world's uh, most protected and culturally rich indigenous communities in the world. And a lot of them overlap in all three. Uh, lots of finance in areas that are highly biodiverse and highly populated by indigenous communities. And what the Chinese are learning the hard way, the way uh, the World Bank and U.S. companies did in the 1970s and 80s, is that while the government might give you one of these concessions and give you a map out into the Amazon to go start drilling for oil, uh, you're often met by 20,000 indigenous people with machetes and five or six people from uh, New York with Twitter accounts. And these things become uh, huge global campaigns where you thought it was going to be a five-year project for $3 billion, but it turns out to be a $10 billion project with lots of sunk assets. And so uh, the, there's a lot of risk, social and ecological risk, involved in many of these projects as well. So China's doubled the amount of development finance and more than doubled the energy finance. It's complementary around the world. However, the portfolio is very risky. It's, it's loaded with a lot of macroeconomic risk. It's loaded with uh, environmental risk in terms of uh, coal-stranded assets and social costs and it's loaded with, uh, with social and ecological risk, especially in places that are highly biodiverse with, uh, with uh, lots, of, uh, lots of indigenous communities and, and, and community-based issues that are, that are endemic to this kind of finance. Um, on the good, the, I guess the, the million-dollar question is, if you look at the way that uh, Bo Kong outlined how these institutions make decisions, they're much more flexible, nimble, and clear than the multilateral development banks. Multilateral development banks takes a long time to get them to change their mind or, and to be clear on an actual policy. These folks can change their mind and set direction in a second. Um, and so the good news could be that they could make this uh, very uh, clean and inclusive in concert with their Paris and SDG commitments. Um, but there's a lot of political pressure at home that might not make that the case. As China has put things in like a coal cap at home, a lot of the coal companies have uh, have a lot of political and economic power at home, and they're getting finance to go abroad so that they can have a, uh, they can ease that transition at home. So that's the big game that uh, has to be played. But this is an empirical view of uh, of what it looks like. Um, you folks have both of these studies on your web page, I guess. Um, this, these are the two studies here. You can get them on our web page too. And my publisher's here in town, and he'd be mad if I didn't have a cover of my book on there too. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks to both of you for those great presentations and, and for the scholarship that lied behind those slut reports. Uh, for those listening on podcast, I'm David Sandelow at the Center on Global Energy Policy. I'm here with Professor Bo Kong from the University of Oklahoma and Professor Kevin Gallagher from Boston University who have just given us a readout on their scholarship on Chinese global energy finance. And let me just follow up with, um, ask you to say a little bit more about your methodology here. Was, you, know, you spoke a little bit about this, Kevin, but um, how, um, how did you um, come up with this data and um, um, what do you, how did you come up with the data? Right, as, you, as I said, you can go to the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, Asian, uh, all, all these banks, and you can usually download all, it's, it's required through executive orders to be able to have lots of transparency about it. The, the two China the overseas banks don't, don't have that level of transparency. So my, my group, the Global Economic Governance Initiative at Boston University for five or six years has built a database of Chinese overseas finance by these two banks in Latin America. Um, where we build it from the ground up by looking at, uh, at 
at all, all these all these finances do get reported by the finance ministries and the central banks of the host countries. Uh, in other cases, some of those countries some aren't as transparent either. But if they have an IMF program, they re they re they report it there. So it's a massive project in what we call economic journalism. Mm -hmm. And my colleague Deborah Brodigam uh, uses the same methodology to look at China and Africa. So we started by to make this global database. We pooled our two databases that we put together. Um, and then we hired a lot of graduate students to go and use the same methodology and look, uh, look, look around the world. Uh, Erica Downs, I noticed she's a, a fellow here. Uh, she did some groundbreaking work looking at, uh, looking at Kazakhstan and Russia. We used some of that data and, uh, and confirmed that. Um, but it took, it took a, lot of, a lot of scraping around. And um, we were in the right order of magnitude, as I said, but it wasn't until uh, mm -hmm. it got into the newspapers and we had a Chinese, we have a Chinese co-author from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and he was contacted um, after the article in the Financial Times and was able to sit down with the China Development Bank and go loan by loan. And, uh, and we know we're off by six, six projects, most of them in, in Russia. So the, the data is out there. You just have to go, 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 go dig to find it. Um, uh, you report on the th amount of financing that's provided. Did you get data on the terms of the financing? Yeah, um, not as not for every loan, um, but we our database has the maturity, the interest rates, um, and and so forth. And if you look, it's. It's it's not cheap enough for the Colombias and the um, and most investment grade countries, um, which is why the pro, the risk profile looks different. Um, w as Bo said, that you know, they can the, the these banks can can are AAA because they're essentially backed by the government and they can be competitive, but not as competitive as uh, as the private market in a, in a world of, of quantitative easing. But for instance, Ecuador, which uh, which has been out of the capital market since its partial default in 2008, uh, it's very expensive for them to borrow, borrow and uh, and China has been a, uh, a bargain basement relative to that. Um, we find that they're about as com as competitive as the World Bank, about as competitive as the World Bank. But a lot of these countries favor the Chinese banks over the World Bank because the Chinese banks don't have conditionalities that are very co uh, controversial in a lot of the countries, especially the countries that uh, that where most of the finance is uh, is concentrated. Meaning that the tenors and the and the interest rates are roughly comparable to World Bank loans. Yeah, the interest rates and tenors are, but uh, they're not going to so make you privatize anything at home or anything like that. And are, is there grant financing coming out of the institutions? No, there's no. Uh, there's there's uh, these are all non-concessional uh, finance in the CDB, um, but they do have some non-concessional finance, but no no grant. Um, and so they will package a lot of these things together, but as, as far as we know, there, are, there isn't a huge amount of grant funding as, as a part of these. We actually think that's, a, um, that's a, uh, an untapped opportunity for the Chinese because the, the Chinese, these two banks do all in one pool set have concessional and non-concessional finance and a lot of it. Um, and clear directions. And if you've dealt with the Washington-based institutions, they, they all, uh, IDA, MEGA, IFC, and the World Bank are three different buildings with three different boards, with three different missions, and uh, lots of uh, politics in between them. It's hard to get them to, uh, to blend their instruments, although that is the big game in Washington right now. How do you blend instruments to go from billions to trillions? Really easy to say at a press conference in Washington at the, at the uh, annual meetings, but really hard to do when you literally have different buildings, different staffs, different cultures, and different politics. And the Chinese are more poised because all these people are in the same building. And so they can, uh, if, they, if they worked at it a little better, they can blend instruments with concessional, non-concessional, and grant to be able to fill the financial viability gap for clean energy over, uh, over dirtier energy. But they haven't, uh, they haven't exploited that opportunity uh, yet. I think your list of countries that are getting these loans mostly did not include what in the World Bank would be called IDA countries, the poorest of the poor. Is it your understanding that these banks are not providing financing to the poorest of the poor um, countries, or, or uh, do, you, do we know the answer to that? Some, some, it's mostly middle income countries, but there, uh -huh. but, um, uh, 
but Nicaragua, Ecuador, not the poorest of the poor, but, but uh, you know, lower middle income countries. It's, it's, really, it's really driven, these, these are policy banks, um, not necessarily development banks the way that we would think of them. Uh -huh. and, um, and so there's often an overlap between financing for what a country wants as long as it overlaps with some of these other targeted, targeted global industrial policies that the country has. Bo Kong, you spoke some about um, the China Exim Bank and the China Development Bank leadership. Could, could you just tell our listeners more about those two institutions, what, for, particularly for people who may not be familiar with them, what are they and what are their goals? Sure. Um, both policy banks were created in 1994 as uh, uh, policy arms of the central state to pursue a uh, developmental agenda at home, primarily. Um, uh, from day one, there was a little bit division of labor. Uh, the China Export and Import Bank was primarily used to engage in trade finance, both uh, in terms of importing uh, technologies, equipments, China needed to pursue its developmental agenda at home and also to assist Chinese companies with exporting um, China's manufacturing capacity. Um, but the CDB is a little bit different because the CDB was primarily a, a domestic uh, developmental focused um, financial arm of the state. But over time, as I said, uh, after China launched uh, and the going out strategy, uh, the CDB became more and more engaged in supporting the global expansion of Chinese energy companies. And with respect to the, um, the way they, uh, they organized these, uh, these uh, activities, um, the CDB does provide trade finance. Oftentimes, uh, the rates are quite attractive depending on uh, the specific uh, partner country you are talking about, specific project you are talking about, because the CDB, uh, because the China Exim, Exim Bank does coordinate with the Ministry of, Ministry of Commerce, which is responsible for carrying out China's foreign economic uh, diplomacy. Um, but the CDB, um, during the period of 2008 and 2015, pursued or uh, was tasked to pursue commercial reform and as a result, you see this interesting pattern where the CDB actually oftentimes charges uh, a higher rate than some of the multilateral development banks, um, simply because the CDB had to issue bonds at home and during this particular period of time when they had to get approval for this zero risk weighting from the CBRC, China Banking Regulatory Commission, every year. That caused a lot of uncertainties. And in fact, in 2011 and, and 2012, the CDB was forced to cancel some of bonds, uh, the, the issuance of you know, financial bonds. So it, it, that domestic element does morph into uh, the way the CDB uh, provides global energy finance. And there, the, the OECD maintains a working group of uh, Exim banks that, um, or for, for, Exim ba for export import banks, which sets a series of disciplines and standards. Does the China Exim Bank participate in that process yeah. in any way? Yeah, China Exim Bank, I think, has signed on to the equator principle, but as to uh, the extent to which the bank actually um, partic you know, carries out uh, the spirit of that principle, I, I'm not in a position to comment on that. I haven't done too much uh, work on that. Kevin might know a little bit better than I do. Um, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, they, uh, the, they're, they're an observer to that working group. Um, they, ha they have signed, the Export-Import Bank has signed on to the Equator principles in, uh, on paper, but uh, right before Paris, that, there was that um, uh, sort of coal commitment that the Chinese did not, did not participate. Uh, in that one on the export on the export import bank, um, I think if there's a headline uh, from your reports, it might be that the China Exim Bank and the China Development Bank are providing as much financing as the multilateral development banks, which is I, I think a fact that many people might not have known. Um, uh, we are now entering a period of the new normal. We're in a period of the new normal in China where 
something you hear a lot about in China, certainly, where, where growth rates are anticipated to be slower than they were for the past 20 years, not surprisingly, since they were so superheated in the past 20 years. Um, do, do, has, do, you, do we know enough about the trends for lending during this period of the new normal? Do we expect them to slow down and um, stay constant? Um, do we, first, do we have any data on that or is, uh, any speculation about those trends? Um, two responses. Um, I think we're getting into this uh, territory of known unknown, so to speak. Um, but we do have some limited data to, uh, to allow us to say something about uh, the, um, the trend of uh, uh, expansion by Chinese companies across the board. Uh, since the, um, the global financial crisis uh, dated back to 2007, 2008, and Chinese companies actually have, have maintained the, their momentum in terms of their global expansion. Um, this morning, I, Kevin just uh, shared with me some data from uh, Bloomberg on the trends of uh, Chinese mergers and acquisitions. Uh, what, what we see is just a new sort of uh, focus on, on strategic capital. Uh, prior to the, 2000, uh, the, the global financial crisis, a lot of the uh, expansion was focused on resources and to, of course, to fill the economic development, which was heavily focused on infrastructure development and investment and capacity expansion. Now that China is, is trying to rebalance itself and try to uh, cultivate this uh, consumption-driven development uh, model, and the Chinese companies have also um, uh, demonstrate this shift in terms of what they target when they go abroad. And they target oftentimes the strategic capital in the form of uh, uh, brand equities, technologies, and distribution um, uh, channels they can use to expand markets and to upgrade their, their capabilities and improve their competitiveness around the world. So there we don't see a necessarily a, a, um, a a major sort of uh, uh, pullback. And what we see, uh, a, a new trend we see is this, uh, uh, this growing uh, participation of, of uh, non-state companies uh, in this new wave of uh, global expansion. Um, as to how this uh, um, economic slowdown might impact the way the policy banks engage the uh, engage the world on development? I think uh, the answer there is, what well, the picture we see there is quite fragmented. On the one hand, one could argue that uh, now with this new policy to turn the CDB into a policy bank, um, it's, it's, one could, uh, it's plausible that the banks will, will stick to the state agenda even more closer. Because at least between 2007 and 2015, the bank was allowed to pursue commercial reform. And now it's clear that the, the, the state will use a different set of criteria to, to evaluate the banks, and a lot of which has nothing to do with profitability. Instead, a lot of that has a lot to do with the political mandate, simply to, to implement the state agenda. On the other hand, China has gone through this rapid debt expansion. And, and its financial system, of course, uh, has gone through this whole circle as to how it reforms itself since the 1990s. One would, argue, one would um, feel a little bit uncertain as to how long China can continue this. And, and one question, of course, is whether domestic financial reform will have implications for the way uh, the country engages in global development finance. Can I add a little, bit, a little bit to that? I would say we actually have two, two big punchlines in the one that you said is, is the second one. The, fir the okay. first one is that, uh, that, that China's financial system has mobilized itself to be, the, to be an incredible new entrant into the global energy financial scene. It's because it's not just the loans that these banks are giving to uh, foreign governments. Um, the slide before that in Bose that we look at in our, in our joint study is that at home, these same firms, Sinook, Sinopec, et cetera, are getting massive lines of credit to go abroad. 
as part of the Go Global policy. Um, they have the support that no export-import bank in the West w would ever be able to mm -hmm. to, uh, to provide, and that no private sector bank from or or, or uh, financiers in a town like this would 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 would, ex would extend to a uh, latecomer state-owned state -owned company uh, to go global uh, in the 21st century. And that part of that, so the same banks, Export Import Bank, China Development Bank are saying, Sinook, Sinopec, here's billions of dollars of lines of credit and loans to go to Africa, to go to South America. Then there's also $160 billion worth of finance to the government. Um, and sometimes there's a big overlap uh, between the two of them. In terms of going forward, I. Uh, I always say that there's a different story between the banks and the companies, although I think after this morning's data coming out, it might change my tune on the companies. In terms of the banks, I think we can really expect a lot more finance or continuing the um, continuing the increase because each of these two banks have just received $40 billion of new capital, not callable capital, but paid in capital, 40 billion, 40 and 42, right? Um, to execute the uh, Silk Road Belt Road Initiative, you know, so if you imagine that's, you know, we quibble in Congress about uh, is, uh, increasing the base capital of the World Bank uh, by, you know, single-digit billions, and it takes five years to get that. They just put 40. They put a. They put. They basically added a World Bank and a European Investment Bank to these two banks in one day. Um, and so those, they haven't even started uh, uh, lending off of that, um, and b those are both for the uh, Belt Road Initiative. So it's going to be a, a lot more. Um, but the composition is slightly changing. Um, they've done a lot of due diligence, and there's different domestic pressures at home. Uh, from 2003 to 2013, a lot of the finance was for, um, was for mining ex and extraction um, and, power, and power plants. But because of the global prices are, of those are on the decline, um, there's been less of that. There, more of it is moving into infrastructure now than it, uh, which would include some power plants, but certainly not the copper mines and the uh, and thing and things of that nature. Now, in terms of companies, um, when we sit and talk with them in China or in the in the host countries uh, in Peru, where we we did most recently, and we'd ask them, what 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 does the new normal do? What is, what's that going to be for your individual business strategy? And we'd, we'd get a great academic answer. It depends. But they would say it depends on, A, what Bo said, how much domestic debt does the company have at home, right? A lot of these countries are highly indebted at home. And so that doesn't allow them to be as pivotal global. Two, to what extent uh, are members of the company um, part of the, uh, have, have they come under the surveillance of the corruption uh, corruption? Uh, Surveillance that's going on. Some of the some of the biggest energy companies have executives that are uh, that are under watch or that are already uh, involved in the process, and that makes you a, a little bit more timid. If you're not if you're not highly indebted or you're not on a corruption watch list, this is their this is the perfect time. You have a massive uh, a massive line of credit from one of these two banks, and Western companies are trying to. Uh, uh, get rid of their assets as quick as possible because the price isn't where they thought it, what, where all their models said it would be in 2016, uh, back in 2010, and the exchange rates are, are so depreciated that there's a lot of debt that companies are, are really getting rid of this stuff. Um, and it looks like the latter is overdoing the former. Uh, if you, I, I tweeted out this article that's in the uh, Bloomberg this morning that shows that 2016 was the largest year for uh, Chinese m as overseas uh, on record. And so uh, it looks like uh, that is really happening. I'm David Sandelow at Columbia University. I'm here with Professor Kevin Gallagher from Boston University and Professor Bo Kong from the University of Oklahoma talking about China's global energy finance. Um, Kevin, I think some of our listeners may not be familiar with One Belt, One Road, which is referred to in your text. Could you just explain briefly what is the One Belt, One Road initiative? Maybe both. Or yeah. Professor Khan. Yeah. Oh, sure. I'll try my best. Uh, um, it's, it's basically um, an idea to connect China to uh, markets around China um, along the lines of the old Silk Road, now um, you expand that to the maritime domain, 
And, and there are a couple of uh, drivers behind this idea. One idea, one, one thought um, is quite similar to uh, w what the world was like uh, after World War II, when the United States was the only prosperous economy in the world, but certainly it would like to export to the rest of the world. But when everyone else was so poor, and the question is who could afford to buy from the United States? And in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, China, the West uh, started to cut back on importing from China, but China had, still had so much uh, excess capacity that it would like to export. So where do you export? And the, you know, the answer is that when the West is not important too much, maybe we should look at uh, emerging economies. But the, it, those emerging economies do not necessarily uh, have the financial well or the, uh, the, uh, the revenues to import. And the idea is let's help them to get rich and so that they can continue to import from us, from China. And of course, this has a lot to do, um, and this uh, you know, uh, begins with this idea of, of infrastructure development that is quite consistent with how China has grown its own economy. Um, so that's what you see right now. This uh, one road, one belt strategy extends across uh, over about 60 countries around the world. And, and uh, um, it includes uh, a lot of infrastructure projects, ports, roads, um, you know, highways, railways, etc. cetera. And um, is that a fair description? Yeah, uh, I, I should put in a plug for my colleague at Boston University, Min Ya, has uh, done a lot of research on the domestic politics of the of the One Belt One Road or the Belt Road initiatives. And one of the things that's that's really interesting is that it's it's China's response to the TPP, the Trans Pacific Partnership, which is the U.S. Uh, uh, trade and integration. Uh, uh, and the Chinese were were very aggravated that they weren't part of it, uh, to say to say the least. And so uh, this, this came out of a, uh, the need for a regional integration strategy in to, to challenge the, the, the TPP idea. And so we've, we've got an interesting contest going on in the region. We've got uh, you, uh, trade lawyers from the United States uh, wanting to uh, integrate the region through a set of rules. And we have the Chinese Belt Road Initiative, which will integrate the region with uh, hardwired infrastructure and, and finance. And we'll have to see. Uh, uh, um, which one wins friends and keeps away enemies. Well, thanks. Well, I want to bring in our audience as well. If you've got a question, please, uh, we've got a microphone in back. And while people are going up there, um, Kevin, maybe uh, just uh, say a word about your new book. Um, uh, Thank you. Interested to hear. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I've, I've written a book called uh, The China Triangle, uh, Latin America's China Boom and the Fate of the Washington Consensus. Uh, by Oxford University Press. It came out earlier this year. And it really, in a nutshell, it looks how uh, from 2003 to 2013, how China became South America's number one trading partner. And all the dynamics, the economic dynamics of how that happened, um, it, was, it led to the largest growth spurt in, uh, in Latin America since the 1950 to 1982 period. And it did erase a lot of the inequalities that happened in the period that you call the Washington Consensus, 1980 to 2002. But since so much of the growth was related to m minerals, mining, et cetera, it was endemic to uh, environmental degradation and social conflict. And uh, the Latin American countries, unfortunately, didn't save a lot of those windfall rents that they got during that period. And so here we are with low uh, commodity prices, and uh, the regions are seeing negative growth, uh, seeing the worst growth profiles and worst, de worst debt file profiles since the, uh, since the 1980s. So the Chinese really gave Latin America a real gift, especially after the financial crisis. But unfortunately, they didn't capitalize it. And uh, they're right back where they are after, after every crisis in the North. And copies are available on Amazon? And uh, Amazon, you name it. Google, the China Triangle, Kevin Gallagher. Thank you, Dave. Commission, uh, you get some commission for that. Please identify yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, it's uh, Arthur Kober from GavCal Dragonomics. Um, I have an informational point and then a couple of quick questions. Informational point is uh, uh, David raised the, the question of whether uh, uh, China Exim is a participant in the um, uh, OECD arrangements on export uh, banks. And that's distinct from the equator principles, and the answer is that they are not. Uh, and this is actually a point of considerable contention. 
Uh, one simple example of why this is relevant is that last year the OECD arrangement uh, 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 developed uh, much more stringent new rules for uh, financing of coal-based power yeah. plants. Yeah. Um, and uh, China, by not being participation in this, uh, I think is, is clearly putting themselves on the other side. And that actually leads to one of the questions I have, which is that um, what, what do we make of the fact that, that so much of this uh, financing by both Exim and CDB is on highly traditional, basically backward-looking, uh, subcritical uh, coal-fired power plants. What, what does this tell us about the stated commitment of the Chinese government to large-scale finance of uh, new and clean technologies? It's, does, your data does not seem to suggest that there's you know, a whole lot of evidence of that. And uh, second question related to finance, uh, you noted that um, the, the two banks have just received uh, enormous new infusions of capital. Uh, I actually find this somewhat concerning because this is the second time in the last two and a half years that they've been recapitalized to the tune of tens of billions of dollars. And couldn't this equally tell us that the uh, finances of these banks are uh, so poorly managed in terms of the return that they're getting on their existing asset base that there is no mechanism for them to, to expand but by uh, continued infusions from the Chinese government. Thank you. Yeah, well, while, while we're plugging books, uh, Arthur's book is definitely the must read on how to understand the Chinese economy in English. It just came mm -hmm. out a couple months ago, right? It's, it's called The Chinese Economy, What Everyone Needs to Know. I, uh, I read it days after it came out um, and yeah, that, that, is what I, that is what I said about the Export-Import Bank, that they're just an observer in the OCD group, and they, around Paris and a part, around a lot of the SN, uh, strategic and economic dialogues, there was an attempt to try to get China, the Ch China Export-Import Bank to sign on to these, but, um, but uh, since the Japanese were so reluctant too, and there's lots of competition with the, J the Japanese when it comes to global coal finance, uh, they, they did not take part. I know it's still part of a conversation, but uh, they're, they're still reluctant. Uh, which gets to, I think, is the million dollar question. A lot of this is uh, not the cutting edge coal technology, and it's a lot of what they are capping and phasing out at home. And so if you look at, uh, we did a study where we compared China's overseas finance with Japanese overseas finance uh, in the, 20 years ago, and you see a similar pattern, right? You have economically powerful companies at home that were part of the energization of the Chinese economy, which was very much coal-based because it's, a, it's an asset that they have, the coal, coal in the ground, and very politically tied and very politically connected to the, to the entire apparatus. And so one way to, get a, to politically sell phasing out his home is to make uh, uh, opportunities ab abroad. That's what the Japanese did with textiles, that's what the Japanese did with auto, using their export-import bank and using their global, fi uh, global development banks to do it. It's very much sort of the East Asian uh, d development model to, to, to help with the political economy. And so uh, that is what, that's what the numbers reveal from, from here, that 66% of all of this is uh, overseas coal plants. And uh, yeah, I know it's, a, it's an area of, of real dialogue uh, between the U.S. and China in terms of the strategic and economic dialogue because we have our, we have a executive order that says that we are no longer going to play our, our core role in financing coal uh, overseas in, unless it's in, uh, in the poorest of a poor country where uh, there's no other alternative for, for access, access to finance. Um, but uh, a lot of us were hoping that, that something like a commitment to um, to, to be more green in their global financial portfolio was something that would come out of the G20 because China, to their credit, did make global green finance a core part of the agenda, but this part was not. And uh, it, it really needs to be, if we're, if we're going to, uh, if we're gonna meet our Paris commitments, um, that the Chinese, with, you know, the Chinese took such a leadership role on making Paris happen by signing the agreement with the United States. Um, Chinese overseas coal finance has to be repackaged to green finance because, as I said, if you if you take our estimates of the emissions of China's overseas coal plants that it's financed, those alone are the eighth largest emitter, and uh, bringing serious uh, social and economic costs to the global economy. And on the recapitalization, does that send a signal about fiscal discipline in your view? Yeah, you know, uh, the, um, you, you know, 
every everyone's asking what what what's going on with the Chinese financial system, and we all, most of us go to Dragon Economics to get the uh, get the question, uh, get the answer. But um, uh, both of these banks in the past months have have gotten involved in debt for equity swaps, where they're starting to pick up a lot, of, use some of this capital to pick up a lot of the bad debt in the uh, in the corporate sector, and so. It remains to be seen how how strong these banks have been. They they both maintain triple they investment grade um, from outside credit rating agencies largely because of the incredible amount of non-performing loans that they have. And the way to keep your ratio of non-performing loans high is to turn those loans that are going bad into equity. And so how much can you play with your balance sheet and still be a good bank is a great question, and I'm, I'm not close enough. But it's definitely what, uh, what everyone's concerned about. All these global expansion plans could quickly become uh, dormant if, uh, if these policy banks, which are now the, the ones that are the most agile outside of the People's Bank of China, which has a multi-trillion dollar war chest for rescue attempts, but uh, they are the most agile to be able to move in and pick up the bad debt. Bo, did you want to yeah, come in? Just a quick uh, footnote uh, about uh, recapitalization and uh, what it means about, uh, what it implies about uh, governance and operations of these two, those two policy banks. And we don't know too much about how they operate at the detailed level. Um, because they're not terribly transparent, but we can infer on the basis of the data we have. If you look at the role of the CDB in Venezuela, you look at the role of CDB in China's, in the bursting of the solar bubble uh, in China, and you look at the role of CDB in financing local government, uh, finance vehicles and urbanization on the basis of land um, uh, mortgage and certainly you can argue that uh, the CDB has an issue of allocative efficiency um, that, that may be, um, you know, um, uh, that may expose the, 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 uh, a lot of issues that we worry about uh, as to whether China can continue to use this as a, as a model, as a vehicle to continue this, uh, this finance. Uh, the fact that China is so dependent upon these two policy banks when engaging the world on global finance means that um, the world is also vulnerable to policy uh, uncertainties and policy problems in China in many, many respects. And I think the broader point is that, you know, these are not the only problems these policy banks have. In a way, you have a broader problem with, with how the entire financial system um, but the PBOC, the central bank, is, is, way, you know, is way behind the CDB. So that, that I think, uh, provides a cautionary tale for anyone that tries to take the story too far to say that, you know, this is going to stop. I think uh, this, the fact remains that the system is still fairly closed. That gives the, the ability of the Chinese government to continue to use domestic finance to, you know, expand its agenda overseas. Thank you. Sean. Thank you. My name is Shen Yan. I'm a visiting fellow at the School of International Public Affairs. Uh, I have two questions uh, uh, regarding to the professor's um, um, speech. But first of all, uh, I would like to congratulations to the, um, the data set that you mentioned that you started from the scratch. Uh, the project-based database is really difficult to set up, so um, there's really um, a lot of job you have done. Uh, but things you have mentioned, uh, you're talking about the uh, project-based um, loans or, or the projects that you mentioned. I was interesting about things you already got the maturities or rates. I was curious if you pay attention to the payback uh, capabilities that those project loans are. Uh, or you say project loans, or maybe um, the direct loan lending to the, the government. What is the performance uh, that you're monitoring, especially given the fact that you, you've mentioned that if uh, the total amount of the, the financing uh, is equal to the multilateral development banks? Uh, I was curious about how much is the percentage, uh, percentage of the, uh, the loans in energy sector uh, that these loans are, are comp uh, composite with. And, uh, what the fact that if in as we see in the past two years as the uh, global commodity cycle is going really severe, uh, what do you what's your view in terms of the uh, the loan payback uh, capabilities in the next five or ten years? 
uh, if we see the, the low oil price uh, areas will be continued, uh, is that going to change the mentality or the, the mindset of these development banks uh, going forward for their, um, for their uh, continued lending? The second question is about the, uh, the vehicles that we are thinking about. As we see, there are a chunk of money there uh, that these development banks can do. But really, there needs somebody to, to use the money or say to take the money out. Then previously we see the uh, uh, state-owned com uh, companies or say the direct lending to the governments uh, become two major channels that we actually export those monies. But do you see on this current uh, anti-corruption or we see you mentioned these current domestic pressures of these state-owned enterprises uh, now, do you still see in the next couple of years or will they still be the main uh, game players that taking this money out? Uh, with the um, taking the pressure of maybe the non-performing loans or the uh, payback for the project will be going down. Uh, what's your view about what will be the next main uh, mainstream players in terms of uh, exporting those capitals out of the boundary? Thank you. I tried the first one. You tried the second one. Sure. All right. Uh, thank you, Shun. Um, for the first one, in terms of the payback capabilities, as far, as far as we know, the Chinese have been paid back for all of their loans thus far. One of the things that they do to try to, that, that seemed really sharp from a finance perspective, uh, was they were able to extend financing to countries that were a little bit more risky by securing the loans in a commodity that the country had. In Latin America, it's all oil, but in Africa, I did a joint study with my colleague uh, Deborah Brodigam, and they're securing it with cocoa, with diamonds, with all sorts of things. Now, of course, those prices went down too, and so now these uh, and the most of the contracts were f for, for a, fi a fixed sale of a number of you know, a fixed amount of uh, of a certain amount of barrels of oil or, or pounds of cocoa and things like that, and so those uh, those did not turn out to be the natural hedge. That um, that the that the banks thought they thought they might be, um, because they basically go in the same same direction uh, as uh, as the export profile and the way that the country goes, and so it's you know like like we say in our in our report there's there's risk there's this macroeconomic risk all out there, um, but thus far everyone has paid them back uh, in the past couple of weeks the Chinese have uh, we know that that Venezuela and Ecuador are knocking on everybody's door besides the IMF. Um, for uh, for financing, they've both secured some some good financing from the FLAR, the Andean Reserve Fund, which is sort of the alternative to the IMF in Latin America. Um, but uh, Venezuela and Ecuador are, are two good contrasts on this. So both of them have gotten a lot of loans. They're, they're the lion's share of the loans from Latin from in the Latin America region. In addition to Brazil, you go to Venezuela, it's hard to find the project. Uh, there's been a number of Associated Press articles, folks that I've talked to, that they went out and tried to look for the actual projects. And they're definitely in the central bank balance sheet, but they never got off the ground or there was something that uh, where the money got diverted um, and it hasn't been that well executed. Um, Ecuador is a totally different story. You go to Ecuador, you see Chinese-made power plants everywhere. Chinese uh, hydropower plants, Chinese oil refineries, uh, the, the Chinese presence there is, 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 is immense. Um, and Moody's uh, here in town, remember I noted earlier that in 2008 there was a partial default in Ecuador, so they weren't, they weren't in the capital markets, and so they were actually relying on China for a lot of their, a lot of their financing. And Moody's went there in 2010, uh, no, m more recently, I, uh, 2012, 2013, and they actually noted the fact that the Ecuador was paying China back so well that they upgraded, uh, they upgraded Ecuador and allowed them to go back into the private capital markets. That's, that's a really interesting story, which has big, broad implications for the regime or lack of regime in sovereign debt restructuring. But uh, Ecuador has been really good with the money in terms of using it to actual build projects that, uh, that allowed them to pay them back, but uh, it's easy to pay anybody back when the uh, oil price is 100. Um, I talk with the Ecuadorans a lot, and they are, um, like everybody, they watch the oil price the way my kids want to watch video games. And uh, it's, 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 it just really depends on how long and for how, how, how long and how low it is, especially for the Nigerias and the, and the Venezuelas and, and the Ecuadors. So some countries are using the money and putting it for productive use. Now, there's these other risks in terms of the climate and social risks, which are huge in Ecuador. My institute's done a 
done a, a big case study on that. And even though the Ecuadorians are using it, they're paying it back. It's contributing to gross fixed capital formation. Ecuador had the largest amount of gross fixed capital formation during 2003 to 2013 in Latin America. Pretty, pretty amazing. Um, but uh, these projects uh, have been a major source of social conflict and uh, in the Amazon with indigenous groups and global campaigns and so forth. So there's that risk too. You've got, yeah, sure. You too. And with respect to the question about uh, uh, main players uh, in the future, um, I think there's no doubt uh, based on the current reform and restructuring of these two policy banks that they will continue to be the dominant players. One way to analyze this is to look at alternatives. What alternatives do you have? You have, you know, as I said, uh, debt markets, equity markets, and fiscal finance, and um, commercial banks. Uh, they all are confronted with a number of constraints that the paper, the larger study, went into. And so I don't think they are viable options right now. Um, and moreover, under the current leadership, um, the central government has made very, very clear that the role of the party in the SOEs uh, is a key, uh, is a, is a key uh, principle. Um, uh, it's a key principle for the companies to, to foster and to stick to. So it's clear this anti, with this anti-corrupt, you know, with this anti-corruption, the, the, the state has more ability to actually to hold these companies accountable. Um, not necessarily accountable in the, sen the same sense you, you, you use in the U.S., but certainly the, 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 the state has reasserted itself uh, in the area of en energy. As you recall, uh, some of the scholars, including myself, um, have uh, for a while talked about the, um, the decline of the state and rise of, of powerful uh, NOCs or powerful companies in the energy field. I think it's very clear this anti-corruption has totally changed the dynamics. As the New York Times article uh, a couple of days ago pointed out, uh, Xi Jinping made it very clear that who is the boss um, in China. And so I, I think the, the political economy makes it very clear that both the SOEs and state financial institutions will continue to be the main instruments China uses to carry out its agenda, both at home and abroad. But this does not contradict with the, the other growing trend that is private companies um, are more and more active on the global markets. These are not contradictory. In the way one could argue that the, the, the private companies want to go abroad simply because they don't have opportunities at home. They are, they are, they, they are opportunity constrained at home because of lack of domestic reform in many areas. These private companies sit on a lot of capital but they, they just can't have a meaningful role in those areas. So that's why they, uh, they go abroad, um, for, of course, of, together with many other reasons. Thank you. We have five more minutes. I see we have two questions. Why don't we, take both of you, ask questions, fast. and then we'll uh, take answers and final comments from our guests. My name is Joanne Dixon. I work in power market and power infrastructure development in emerging markets like Pakistan, Nigeria, Myanmar, places where Chinese finance plays a very large role. I have two questions. One is pretty simple. Uh, between your two presentations, there was one uh, big number shown in Chinese finance that was heavily in oil and mining, and then in the second presentation, largely in power. And maybe I missed the distinction between those two big numbers, but could you draw that distinction? And then also, given the volume of financing that's available to these higher risk countries, do you feel like this volume of financing that isn't available through other more commercial mechanisms is a disincentive to make the reforms necessary to improve the political and uh, policy environment to improve their risk ratings. Thank you. Why don't we take last question right here. My name is Jean Lurch. I'm the managing partner of the G3 uh, advisors. It's basically investment advisory among US, China, and Europe. My question, 
directly to Kevin, although everybody, the uh, data is very impressive. I'm really um, touched by how much work you've done. Um, to Kevin, the Bretton Wood system, you, you put the slice in. My question is, the, about a week ago, China announced the direct trading with uh, Abu Dhabi, um, Dubai. I mean, the Saudi Arabia and the uh, United uh, Arab U, uh, UAE directly trading in the Remingbi and uh, the Dirham. What do you think of that? Is that, well, obviously maybe a little bit irrelevant to today's question, uh, the topic, but it's much more larger scale. Yet there's a relevance because, in my opinion, uh, 25 years ago, uh, when I started my career there, it's unheard of, but 25 years later, it is happening. And those are the major oil players. Uh, what happened, uh, what will happen to petrol dollars? Great, thank you uh, very much. Yeah. So we are almost out of time. Any quick answers to these questions and final thoughts? Uh, well, first of all, the, the question about the, about the seemingly conflicting pie charts, one of them was CDB and Export-Import Bank finance to home companies to go abroad, and that's the one with the majorities in oil and, and gas. And then the other one is CDB and Export-Import Bank financing to, uh, to co other co countries abroad, and that's why you get the, the two different ones. Um, in terms of RMB internationalization and the threat to the Bretton Woods, we, we gave this, uh, we were at a conference all day in Washington on that on Friday. Uh, what was your take on that? Uh, why don't you take uh, that one? I, th I think it's a fair to say that it's a long shot. Um, for a variety of reasons, domestic, uh, cons domestic uh, uh, constraints and the inertia in the global financial system. And uh, the, um, I don't think China is there uh, financially to replace the dollar-based system. And the dollar-based system, of course, also has a lot of inertia as well. And, um, but it doesn't mean that China will not continue to push this agenda of uh, RMB internationalization. It's, it makes a lot of commercial sense in many respects. With respect to other alternative forms of finance, I think I, I touched on that a little bit. And I would just add that uh, if China were to reform its uh, um, capital markets and uh, allow capital markets to play a more meaningful role, I would see that as an alternative, viable alternative option. If you look at the way the Chinese financial system is configured, it's heavily, heavily bank-based system, very, very different from the way the financial system works here. Um, where indirect finance plays a much larger role. But, but I don't think China is there. But uh, it doesn't mean that China won't be there. In fact, there's an attempt to encourage the trend. But sometimes we see two steps forward, one step, fo one step back. So that's sort of the, the nature of the, uh, this, the reality here. Thank you. Well, uh, Kevin Gallagher and Bo Kong, thank you very much for your great scholarship, your uh, fascinating presentations, and your thoughtful answers. This is just one of couple of great events that we are sponsoring here at the Center on Global Energy Policy in the coming weeks. Uh, on November 1st, uh, we have um, uh, the IEA is presenting its 2016 Renewable Energy Market Report from 9.30 to 11 on November 1st in room 1501 in the SEPA building. And on November 2nd, we're uh, thrilled to have Amory Lovins uh, talking from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Columbia Law School in room 103. Please join me in giving Kevin and Bo a big round of applause. Thanks. Thank you.